as Jack said, let's sit down, buckle up those uh, restraints and uh, get ready for a whirlwind tour of the solar system. As seen through the eyes of uh, many explorers, uh, robotic explorers, as humans have only been out as far as our moon. And, you know, we could have entitled this talk over 60 years of solar system exploration. And we really have, we've explored from the areas, regions around our sun, all the way out to the most distant worlds, our Kuiper Belt objects like Pluto and uh, Arakov. And we'll try to touch some of those highlights here today. So if you look at this very busy graphic, if you look at the upper uh, left-hand corner, you'll see the sun and that's where we'll start. And you'll see there's uh, planets like Mercury, Venus, uh, Earth, all the way out to the moon, Mars and beyond. And all those circles or swirls are missions that have gone to these worlds. And this is as of late uh, 2012, so it's about nine years old, but it, you know, there, it just gives you an idea of how many missions have explored the inner planets, gets a little fewer as you go out to the outer planets. And then uh, you know, once you hit uh, Pluto, there's not a whole lot. So let's go through some of this and start uh, right now. So the sun, I mean, when we go outside at night and look up at the sky, we see stars and our sun is the closest star to us. And it's the only one that we can study up close. And that's important to us. The sun provides the heat and light that keeps us alive here as we, uh, for us here on earth. And also it interacts with us with uh, things like the Northern lights or events that uh, affect our uh, say radio systems, satellites. So it's important to understand our star as much as we can. And there have been several missions. Uh, this is like a, a, a slide of the plethora of missions that have gone out to explore the, the, the solar um, environment. And we'll only focus on a couple here today. And I might say, you know, you might be upset we don't cover your favorite mission, but I'm sorry, there's only so much we can cover in about an hour. But the first mission that went out and studied the sun, uh, it's not even on this graphic, was Helios, that was launched way back when in uh, 1974. It was a joint German and uh, NASA mission. But but one of the missions here that really struck home to me, and you'll be hearing about this in the news, we're trying to be current with our descriptions of missions here. This is a video I took of the Parker Solar Probe launch back in 2018 on the largest rocket that we have right now in the arsenal of uh, human exploration and robotic, and that's the Delta IV Heavy. And if you look at this picture of the eclipse sun taken uh, in Idaho in 2017, that's the moon blocking out the sun. And we can see the atmosphere of the sun. This is the outer corona. This spacecraft is designed to move or fly within this outer atmosphere of the sun. So it has to be very specially equipped to withstand that environment. This is another busy slide, but the lower right hand corner shows you the orbits that Parker Solar Probe is taking. Start out on the Earth here, goes past Venus, and in fact use, uses Venus to help uh, change its orbit and get progressively closer and closer to the Sun. If we look at these dates in the upper right, the distances from the, the Sun to the spacecraft have been steadily growing shorter. Um, and, and closer to the sun. So November to September 1st, 2018 and 19 here, it's been greater, over, greater than 20 million kilometers from the sun's surface. The yellow here from 2020 uh, 20 to August of this year, it's between 10 and 20 million kilometers. Starting in November of this year, the spacecraft will be under 10 million kilometers. And just to put that in perspective, Mercury is about 67 million kilometers from the sun. So it's, it's really close. At closest approach in 2025, the spacecraft will only be 6.9 million kilometers away. And it will, and it is already the fastest human made object ever launched. At the end of the mission, it'll be traveling over 690,000 kilometers an hour. Some of the discoveries already, they're understanding how the magnetic field of the sun switches back, causing some acceleration. And also the, there's, a, there's a predicted dust free zone near the center of the sun. And this spacecraft, as it gets closer and closer, is starting to see less dust. So this may be in fact a, a, a true prediction and only time will tell how we can, uh, how this works out. And of course the technology, it has, it's the most autonomous spacecraft ever launched. It has uh, sun sensors or light sensors to make sure that that, uh, that shield in front, a carbon carbon composite uh, shield, very lightweight will protect the spacecraft from the heat of the sun. 
Well, another spacecraft working uh, complementary with Parker Solar Probe is Solar Orbiter. And this is the last launch I was able to videotape before, uh, uh, before COVID hit. So this was one of my last trips to Florida. It was a beautiful night launch using a, an Atlas V rocket. It's on a seven year mission to explore the sun again close up but uh, not as close as parker solar probe at a distance of about 24 million kilometers at a more inclined orbit so it's not in the same plane as parker solar probe it's inclined and it too will be uh, collecting data on the sun's uh, uh, heliosphere uh, and uh, corona to help better define how our sun functions these are some of the instruments that are being deployed, the first test images. The science mission begins as early as November of this year, but it's still in a commissioning phase. So stay tuned, there'll be more results coming from the European Space Agency Solar Orbiter in the not too distant future. Then there are so many other missions being planned. There's uh, missions like AWE, ah, Hermes, here's one called PUNCH, using uh, four CubeSats uh, in Earth orbit to study the corona and heliosphere. Then there's also Sunrise, which is uh, an interferometer type experiment using uh, CubeSats to uh, produce this uh, much larger um, a radio telescope to study the sun and its uh, uh, effects on uh, uh, radio uh, bursts. So a very interesting experiments that are coming up in the not too distant future. This is uh, 2023. Now we're going to jump from heliophysics or the heliophysics uh, space fleet to a planetary fleet. And we're going to start with Mercury and move our way out. Now, Mercury is an object. I don't know how many people have actually seen Mercury in the sky, but it's there. It's challenging because it's so close to the sun. It's our smallest planet in the solar system, closest to the sun, so it's never far away from the sun. But there are some um, uh, apparitions or elongations where it's just right, very easy to see. This was about a year ago, and you can see it in the twilight there over Calgary. Now, the first spacecraft to visit Mercury was way back in 1974, called Mariner 10, one of the um, most successful missions uh, in the Mariner series. It made several flybys, and it only mapped uh, us about, I think, 45 to 50 percent of the surface of, of Mercury, so they had to go back. And I mean, it took 30 years before NASA got the funding approved to go back to this small planet. And so 30 years later, we have MESSENGER. And of course, these are all acronyms, right? NASA loves their acronyms. So it's the Mercury Surface Space Environment Geochemistry and Ranging. There you go, that's a mouthful. But it made several flybys. Uh, unlike uh, going to uh, the outer planets where you look for a gravity boost, it was using Venus to sort of decelerate to get a little closer into Mercury. And it's made several flybys before going into orbit. And it achieved its goal by mapping the entire surface of Mercury. And it made some incredible discoveries. I mean, Mercury appears to be still somewhat tectonically active. It's a cooling planet. And it's, it's, as it cools, it contracts. So we can see these large ridges. And they're not just large ones. There's also very tiny ridges that we can see in this uh, slide here. Some pointed out by arrows, very subtle. And here's a more uh, smaller set of scarps or ridges here produced from the collapsing of and cooling of mercury. And I think this is maybe the most stunning or, or you know, mind boggling um, discovery is that mercury has a lot of ice in the polar region. And you know, one might think, well, and I, and I did, how could mercury closest planet to the sun have ice? Well, Mercury's axial tilt is quite, it's quite vertical. It doesn't, it's not tilted like the Earth at 23 and a half degrees. It's only about two degrees. So when it spins on its axis, then any depressions or craters uh, in the polar regions, they can remain permanently dark. In this graphic here, you can see that in the shadowed areas, it can be as low as 80 degrees Kelvin. That's like minus 190 something. So, I mean, it's very cold. So you can see how these cold traps can trap water ice, and, in some, and based on some data, it might even be more pure, that is with less regulate that we can find on the moon. So Mercury might be a good place to go and look for water. There is another mission. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, it's been 30 years, but there, uh, since uh, Messenger, but um, back since it was launched after Mariner 10, but there's also one being launched by the European Space Agency and JAXA, JAXA called uh, Pepe Colombo, and it will arrive in 2025. So. More news to come from Mercury. It's uh, not dead and gone yet. It's still going to be under investigation. Fascinating world. 
Now, one of the brightest objects that we can see in the sky, and I'm not talking about the waxing crescent moon here, but this object, Venus. Venus is uh, always a stunning object, whether it be in the morning or evening twilight hours. And it was studied, uh, in fact, it was the very first spacecraft uh, target to go by. And it uh, was launched uh, by, Mar by, it was studied by Mariner 2. Now at that time, uh, cameras were thought not to be scientific enough to be put on a spacecraft. Now it was a cloudy world, so it might not have seen much. But anyways, it did fly by Venus in 1962. And it measured some of the solar wind. It also, uh, measured the temperature of Venus. And even though Venus might be a, a twin to Earth, only the twin by, by size, as it is just the evil twin when you think about its uh, high temperatures, high pressures, and there's even sulfuric acid in the clouds. It is, it is not a nice place to visit. But the Russians have been fascinated with Venus and have sent many landers, part of the Venera program. And uh, this is a couple of my favorite here, Venera 13 and Venera 14. And Venera 13 actually lasted over two hours. And you might think, wow, just for two hours, but under those temperatures, nearly you know, as hot as your self-cleaning oven, lead would melt in these, uh, at these temperatures. And 89 to 90 atmospheres, these space, the, the, the landers do not last very long. And this one here is a picture taken by Venera 14, and it's been corrected because a lot of the images look quite uh, distorted by the fisheye lenses that they use. And this one has a funny story as it only lasts about an hour, but on one of the instruments was a, a penetration device to measure the compressibility of the, the Venus uh, rocks and uh, you know maybe study the composition. Well, if you notice right here, that is the lens cap of the camera. When it popped off, it actually, rested in place at exactly where this instrument unfolded and smacked onto the surface of Venus. So they measured the compressibility of the camera lens uh, on the surface. So, oh, well, you know, Murphy's Law sometimes strikes at the weirdest times. That's Venus. And now, as I mentioned, Venus is cloudy. It's got a thick atmosphere. You need a way to peel away those clouds. And NASA launched, I think, again, one of the most successful missions here to study Venus is Magellan. It was launched from the cargo bay of the space shuttle back in 89, and it orbited Venus from 1990 to 1994 before the end of mission. It mapped about 70% of the surface, and it revealed that Venus was an incredibly different world. So if we go through some of the discovery slides here of you know, there's old, an older surface, which you might expect on a, on a planet like Venus, uh, a lot of craters. There's some younger surfaces where you can see volcanoes. So Venus has uh, volcanism and perhaps some recent volcanism because some of these cratered areas don't have a lot of, or these volcanic areas do not have a lot of craters. These are these weird pancake-like volcanic domes that are, you know, about 20 kilometers across. And, you know, could it be a result of the high temperature pressure, viscosity of the lava, just a very unusual shape for, uh, you know, volcanoes. We can go on to lava channels. This is one, this uh, particular lava channel goes on for thousands of kilometers across the surface of Venus, an incredible distance. And again, not many craters are visible where you see volcanic or lava flows. So maybe Venus is not as dead as we might think. It might be quite uh, active tectonically or geologically speaking. Moving on. So there are missions uh, going to Venus in the not too distant future uh, towards the end of this decade. One's called Veritas, which is I think Latin for truth. And it's the Venus Emissivity uh, Radar Radio Science INSAR Topography and Spectroscopy. Well, that's a mouthful. And then, of course, there's another one, Da Vinci Plus, which looks uh, very interesting, as it will uh, not only uh, study uh, Venus from orbit, but also drop a probe into the clouds to study the atmosphere, look at the noble glass gases, the chemistry, and also uh, maybe even land on the surface and get some measurements from uh, there. So that's my first part. We're going to now jump all the way off to the moon, uh, Earth and moon, and we're going to uh, have Jack uh, take this. Uh... All right, yes. So obviously the uh, Earth is where these missions all originated, and most there's quite a few of them that uh, orbit um, the Earth, and I will talk about a few of the interesting ones. But first a question. If 
you recognize that sound, you might be showing your age, because that, of course, is the sound of Sputnik 1, the very first object to orbit the Earth over 60 years ago, launched in the Soviet Union at the time. It was very simple, basically a one watt radio transmitter. Um, they did use the propagation through the ionosphere to learn a little bit about the ionosphere. And they were also able to uh, learn a little bit about the density of the atmosphere uh, from the drag on its orbit. Its launch was uh, what triggered what was became known as the space race, where uh, the US and, and the Soviets continually tried to be the first to do a lot of different things from that point on. The US had actually been working on a satellite for years. They were very surprised by the Sputnik 1s, and they tried to rush a mission uh, just two months later. Um, but the rocket lifted off about four feet and then exploded. Um, the satellite was thrown clear, and apparently it is in the Air and Space Museum. And so this was launched uh, in February 58 on a Juno 1 rocket. And its main claim to fame was that it discovered the Van Allen radiation belt around the Earth. Uh, Canada was actually the third nation to build and operate a satellite. And it was designed to study the upper ionosphere from above. It had a number of instruments, a sweep frequency sounder, several guider counters, and a cosmic radio noise detector. Um, it sprouted there. You see the sounding antenna. Um, there was several, uh, uh, basically went out uh, like 20 meters, essentially, from there, using a very interesting technology for the time. From those humble beginnings, uh, here's an animation of the objects greater than 10 meters in size that are currently orbiting the Earth. The red ones are satellites. You can see quite a few there in the geosynchronous orbit, which I'll talk about. Uh, there's also rocket boosters and all kinds of uh, space junk up there, and many, many, many more pieces that are smaller than 10 meters in size. Um, there's a lot of the original uh, satellites are communications or weather satellites. These are from the GO series. Uh, they're at a geostationary orbit approximately 36 kilometers high, and they remain fixed over a given longitude as they orbit at the same speed as the Earth is rotating. I'm going to talk now a little bit about a few of the uh, orbiting space telescopes. This is mostly an astronomy uh, audience. The Compton Ray Observatory uh, was launched by a space shuttle in uh, low Earth orbit to avoid those Van Allen radiation belts that I mentioned earlier. Um, its main claim to fame. Oh. All right, why are we not going forward? Its main claim to fame was it uh, discovered over 150 new radio energy sources and over 2,500 gamma ray bursts. And this is basically a, a, a map of the distribution of those gamma ray bursts. This was quite a surprise because before the mission, it was thought that most of these gamma ray bursts were related to dense neutron stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So they would have shown up basically on a, a plane there through the center of this image, but this showed that they're mostly from galaxies, other galaxies than the Milky Way. Then we have the Chandra X-ray Observatory. This was studying X-ray emissions from many supernova remnants and black holes. It also discovered the first mid-mass between stellar and supermassive black hole in Mesh uh, 82 galaxy. Um, on its 50th, 15th anniversary, they put out this image showing some of the supernova remnants that had had imaged. You have to realize that it's um, collecting data in very, very short energetic wavelengths, and then they assign colors to them, basically to uh, show more detail on what's actually going on there. It doesn't actually image invisible light. And we have the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is an infrared, so now we're talking longer than visual wavelengths. It was the first satellite to use an Earth trailing orbit, which was later used by the Kepler planet finding mission, which I'll talk about. Infrared is very long wavelengths that can make it through dust and gas. So here we get to look into some areas that visual wavelengths cannot see. It was cooled with liquid helium, which ran out in 2009. Uh, there were still two instruments uh, that were usable, but they did end this mission in, at the end of January this year. And there's one of those images in the Cepheus region. 
And then, of course, we have the Hubble Teus Telescope that everybody knows about, uh, launched by the Discovery Space Shuttle. It was designed to be serviced by the shuttle. And you can see there, there was four servicing missions that the first one basically corrected the flaw in the mirror. Uh, and then they replaced instruments and uh, solar panels, et cetera. And so here are some of the uh, uh, more spectacular images. This is the Crab Nebula or Meshe number one in the constellation of Taurus. This star exploded in 1054 and was recorded by Japanese and Chinese astronomers. And basically, you don't have to be an astronomer to know that something violent probably happened there. The Hubble put together this image from some of their, uh, put together this video from the images near the core, uh, showing wave like structures still expanding from the heart of the pulsar that remains at the center of the, uh, the remnant. This is Meshe 104, known as the Sombrero, in the constellation of Virgo near the border with. Uh, Corvus. It has a very, very prominent dust lane that you can see there, and an unusually large halo of stars, basically, that are uh, surrounding it. Uh, we're looking at it almost an edge on uh, spiral galaxy. There is a 1 billion mass black hole at the center of it, and it has more than 1200 globular clusters um, surrounding it. This is a ground-based image of Meshe number 13, which is a very uh, nice globular cluster that we as amateur astronomers look at. Uh, here is what the Hubble did. It resolves stars right to the core of that cluster. This is one of the more famous images, uh, often titled Pillars of Creation. It's showing part of an active star forming region within the nebula. And Basically, above to the right, there are uh, young stars blasting out a lot of ultraviolet radiation, and it's pushing away the material. But there are some denser regions here that we see, and if they can hang on to enough material, they can form new stars. We also have uh, Hubble Deep Field Images on the left. That's 10 days of observations at a mostly empty part of the sky. The ultra deep field on the right is 1 million seconds of exposure time during 400 orbits in the constellation of Fornax. And there's over 10,000 galaxies in that image. The Kepler Space Telescope was designed to do one thing, look at one area of the sky near Cygnus Lyra border for years. And what it was doing was measuring the brightness of several hundred thousand stars, looking for faint drops in their brightness which might indicate that a planet was transiting the star from our perspective. Basically, um, it found a lot of them. Here is a chart with exoplanet discoveries around other stars, and the yellow ones are the Kepler discoveries. This is from 2017. There have been several hundred more now. So here it was 2,500. Now it's like 2,700. Uh, they basically go back and recheck the data and sometimes use other mechanisms to confirm those planets. There are some uh, Canadian missions uh, with space telescopes, if you like. Here we have MOST, Microvariability and Oscillation of Stars, also known as the Humble Telescope. It's basically the size of a suitcase with a small telescope in it. It was similar to Kepler in that it was looking for drops in the brightness of a stars, but it looked at one star at a time. And one major discovery was that the star Procyon does not oscillate. And that kind of conflicts with previous observations and sort of what they thought the star should be doing. So they have to be you know, doing some more work to figure out what's actually going on there. We also have a University of Calgary mission, Cassiope which was launched in September, 2013. Another one that's studying the ionosphere in a very elliptical orbit. It has, uh, it's collecting data on space storms and plasma outflows from the ionosphere. And at the REO, if you've ever wondered what that little dome that's out in the middle of the field south of the main site, that's the data collection receiver. The next great observatory, hopefully, I put the question mark there, uh, the date has been, Moved again to December 18th this year for the launch from French Guiana. It is being packaged up as we speak and will be shipped via the Panama Canal to French Guiana. 
it's long delayed, over budget, uh, around $10 billion now. Uh, a lot is tied up in this mission. Here's what it looks like all folded up uh, in the launch uh, mode. A lot of unfolding has to happen. Um, those mirrors are gold-plated beryllium, which is optimized for collecting infrared light. So again, this doesn't do as much in the optical side of things. And it will reside in a half-year orbit around Lagrange point two, which is about one and a half million kilometers from Earth opposite the sun. There's a, a place there where gravitationally you can keep it in place quite easily. There is a Canadian contribution. We are providing the fine guidance sensor and the near infrared imager and the spectrograph. So it has to point very, very accurately to do its uh, imaging and Canada's providing the sensor. This has been ready for years and years and years. <laughs> Talk a little bit now about internet satellite constellations. And this is uh, where people want to provide coverage of the earth with low latency communications between sites. And the idea is you put up uh, satellites in these orbital planes and you bounce signals between them uh, type of thing. And so Starlink, which is the one that people most know about, is planning uh, 4,000 satellites in three, like uh, a fix there. It's actually three shells, there'll be five later. And right now there's 1,613 of them are active, but they launched 51 more on Monday night. And this is the start of a second shell, slightly higher. And these ones have lasers that they can communicate amongst themselves with lasers. OneWeb is another operation which uh, is planning 648 satellites at 1,200 kilometers. 288 are active, and they launched 34 on Tuesday morning this week. Uh, Kuiper Systems is an Amazon company that is planning uh, over 3,000 in three shells. China is looking at putting up something for a project, Roscosmos, and several other private concerns. Uh, in late 2018, over 18,000 satellites in low Earth orbit had been proposed to be launched by 2025, and currently over 100,000 have been proposed as part of satellite constellations. Here's basically the deployment of uh, 60 Starlink satellites from a Falcon 9. They basically are, are quite flat in their uh, launch mode, and then each one of them unfolds a solar array for power. And when they launch them, they just put them up there and they let them drift. And then they have ion thrusters to space themselves in an orbital plane. And since they just did this launch, you might see um, something like this in the early evening sky or early morning, which is uh, what we call a Starlink train as they drift apart. This is causing quite a few concerns for ground-based telescopes. Um, here's an image from uh, Sir Tololo, and basically it wipes out, you know, this is over uh, five minute exposures basically wiped out. So you can imagine, now these ones do separate so that they're not all in a train, but there'll be so many um, different orbital planes crossing each other and shells that um, it's going to be a bit of a problem. Starlink has put sun shields on them, which has darkened them to some degree, but uh, it's still a bit of an issue. And of course, around the Earth, you have the International Space Station. This is how it all began, uh, the first two modules. In 2010, it was essentially complete, uh, but we have, there have been a few mod modules added and the Russians have just replaced one in the last month. In fact, <clears throat> on Friday, they just uh, hooked up the power to it. Canada, of course, has Canada Arm 2 and Dexter, uh, the manipulator there that you see at the bottom. This was installed in 2001, and Chris Hadfield did a number of spacewalks uh, helping to install it. Here's just a few factoids, 400 kil kilometers high. It has now been continuously inhabited since November 2000. And normally, it's a six-person crew, and they cycle back in groups of three, although with Crew Dragon now, they typically take four, and uh, they usually spend about six months. 
and hot off the press last evening at six o'clock, roughly Calgary time. Inspiration 4 is a private uh, civilian based mission on a Falcon 9 rocket. Um, basically, um, this is sponsored by uh, Jarek Isaacman, and uh, it's basically raising awareness for a uh, St. Jude's Hospital charity. Uh, they will spend three days up there and they will land, uh, I believe, at five or six o'clock on, on Saturday. Uh, one interesting factoid, it's the highest orbit for a Dragon capsule, and at 585 kilometers, it's the farthest humans have been from Earth since the 2009 Hubble servicing mission. And on to the moon. Of course, it's our closest celestial neighbor and an obvious target to explore. Um, this nodding effect you see here is because the orbit is slightly elliptical and also inclines slightly to the Earth's orbital plane. Here is a chart showing the successful landings on the moon. Uh, the red ones are uh, Soviet missions. You can see they go from the 60s to the 70s. The green ones are the surveyor missions, again ending in 68. And then we have the Apollo missions. And they end in 1972 with Apollo 17. The next landing was China, Chang'e 3, 2013. Uh, basically almost 40 years. <laughs> in between the landings. But as you'll see, um, things are picking up on the moon. Of course, we have to mention Apollo 11, the first landing. This is uh, one of the actually uh, rare photos that shows Neil Armstrong on the moon. He was taking most of the pictures, so he's not in that many of them. And this is only about a dozen years after Sputnik 1. So if you can imagine, you lobbed a radio transmitter to landing on the moon in, uh, in about 12 years. I'll talk a little bit about the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's a very, very successful mission that launched in uh, June 2009. And its main mission is to make detailed maps of the moon. So here we have an image that's actually created from uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter data. It shows everything with a consistent low sun angle as if everything was kind of on the Terminator. So you can see the roughness there. You can see the depressions in the craters and you can see the mountains and things like that. Um, here's a couple of the main features there. Uh, when we look at the full moon, it looks very flat because the sun is directly behind us and there are no shadows uh, showing relief features like the craters on the moon. Of course, that's the front side. It's an orbiting spacecraft and that's what the back side looks like. And as I like to say, it couldn't look more different. Um, this is generally thought to be a result of the early formation of the moon as material was being uh, uh, conglomerated together. There was one uh, large body that's pancaked very slowly on the backside. So it has a thicker crust there and subsequent impacts um, were not able to crack enough to release the lava from the still molten core of the moon. Uh, they can do some other things. This is a, a picture of the landing site of Apollo 11, showing you the descent stage uh, and the, uh, some of the instruments it left behind, the laser ranging retro reflector. Um, uh, they would uh, use a telescope to send a laser pulse uh, to this location and then measure the return time to get a very accurate uh, estimate of the distance. Uh, PFC is a seismic experiment to detect moonquakes. Uh, Apollo 17 was the last landing. They had a, a little rover to run around in, so you can see quite a few tracks there. Uh, March 17, 2013, uh, somebody was videoing the moon and detected an impact on the moon. LRO was launched in 2009, and it was able to take these before and after images showing a new 18 meter, 18 meter crater on the moon. And here's Chang'e 3 with its U2 rover. Uh, this is from 2013. They had a bit of an issue with the rover. Those solar panels are supposed to close up during the two week night and keep it warm, but they had some issues. So it only lasted uh, 42 days. But Chang'e 4 is now on the far side of the moon and it's a carbon copy of this mission. And NASA is planning to go back to the moon. Whether that's uh, stimulated by the Chinese, uh, we'll, we'll never know, I guess. 
Uh, they were targeting a landing in 2024, a new launch system, new capsule. Uh, 2021 is looking pretty uh, dicey. It probably will slip to next year. Artemis 2 will use a crew of four to basically make a trip around the moon. There is a Canadian component. One of those people will be a Canadian astronaut, not to be not announced yet. And eventually this was to be a crewed landing, uh, although it does require a human landing system to be in place in the, uh, the rectilinear orbit before then. And uh, much to the chagrin of Jeff Bezos, uh, uh, SpaceX's uh, uh, Starship was elected to be the, uh, selected to be the lander. And they're going to be building a station, um, which is in this uh, strange orbit. And they'll be able to conduct missions back and forth to the lunar surface. Little Canadian flag there, we will build, be building another arm. It's our specialty on space missions. And uh, in October, there's going to be a little bit of a test mission here to go to what they call a near rectilinear halo orbit. So the Earth is in the background there, and the gateway will follow this sort of bizarre orbit, which is actually uh, technically orbiting the a Lagrange point, not the moon. It's, uh, it's very elliptical so that it's always pretty much in communication with the south pole of the moon, which is where these missions are going to land. And also that we'll be able to communicate with the Earth at all times. Jupiter is a gas giant and the largest planet in the solar system, around 140,000 kilometers in diameter. And here's a scale comparison to the Earth, uh, which has uh, basically 12,750 kilometers in diameter. So Jupiter is around 1,000 times the volume of the Earth. There's been a number of missions that have studied Jupiter. Some of them have been flyby missions, uh, uh, specifically looking at Jupiter. There have been some orbiter missions uh, recently and some missions on their way to the outskirts of the solar system have gone by Jupiter to uh, basically pick up speed using gravitational assist. Um, there are also a number of future missions uh, when we'll be talking about a couple of these later in the show. So Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 uh, were basically developed to do flybys of Jupiter and Saturn. And Voyager 2 also took advantage of the alignment of the outer planets and was able to do flyby missions of uh, Uranus and Neptune after leaving Saturn. You'll note that Voyager 2 was actually launched first, but based on its trajectory, it was going to arrive second. So this is why they named them the way they did. Here's the flight pass basically showing the uh, launch then the flyby missions. This is a animation of Voyager 1 images as it approached Jupiter. It's, it's actually not a video uh, showing the planet rotating. It's basically built up of images with the red spot in the same location. And you can see the basically cloud patterns and movements uh, as it got closer to uh, uh, Jupiter. Uh, these are some of the better images of the four large Galilean moons of uh, Jupiter, basically uh, from the inside out. Uh, I teach kids to remember this order with the saying, I eat green caterpillars. Um, Ganymede is very large. It's actually larger than Mercury. One of the findings uh, from Voyager was that there are active volcanoes on Io, and here you see up in the top left there, this little volcanic plume. It's uh, now estimated that there are over 400 volcanoes on Io. Essentially, all of those little dark areas you see are little volcanic pits. The first orbiter uh, to go to Jupiter was Galileo in 1989. It studied the uh, moons of Jupiter and, and carried uh, several spectrometers. It also carried an entry probe that it dropped into the planet to study uh, the atmosphere as it dropped through the cloud tops. This is one of the uh, best images of Europa, the uh, icy second planet. And here's a bit of a close up. Um, they believe that there's a 15 to 25 kilometer icy crust floating on up to 100 kilometers uh, of uh, liquid water underneath there. And the close-up there shows that potentially they may 
crack occasionally and material basically creeps up through it and creates these sort of segmented features. Um, there is a mission uh, called the Europa Clipper, which is expected to launch in October 2024. It will arrive in 2030 and it will orbit Jupiter with 44 uh, flybys of Europa. Um, you might ask, why are they not orbiting the moon? Um, the radiation environment around Jupiter is very, very intense. Most spacecraft don't last too long if they spend too much time in that environment. So they're going to do this long elliptical orbit and basically just do repeated flybys. Juno is the uh, most recent orbiter launched in 2001, uh, 15 years to get to enter the orbit. And it is in a long 53-day elliptical polar orbit, um, again, with the radiation issue. Um, it had some issues with the helium valves uh, on the propulsion system. They had planned to lower the orbit to a two-week orbit, but with the uh, potential issues, they decided to remain in the 53-day orbit and do the science over a longer period of time. And it is basically studying questions about the formation of Jupiter, it's looking at things like the oxygen to hydrogen ratio, um, trying to understand the, the mass of the core, uh, mapping gravitational radiation fields, et cetera. And the mission has uh, been extended now to September 2025 because they need to do these extra orbits. They, it also has uh, one interesting feature. You see those huge solar panels on here. This is the first mission to go that far outward that does not have a plutonium-based uh, RTG, um, you know, uh, nuclear reactor essentially to provide power. So it has these huge, huge uh, solar arrays and it orbits in a polar orbit. So those are always facing the sun. And it has a, a camera on it called the Juno cam. And uh, we're gonna take a pass from the Northern regions to the South as it makes one of these close passes to Jupiter. And at the closest will be around 4,000 kilometers. Um, it's got very, very active weather. There's uh, swirls and vortices and uh, have you everywhere on that, in the, in the cloud tops there. So very interesting video. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is a bit of a video uh, repeats a few times, uh, animation of the red spot, a giant storm that has been seen on Jupiter for over 300 years. It's uh, basically wider than the Earth's diameter, um, but it has been shrinking over the last few decades. But uh, yeah, quite the storm, 400 kilometer an hour winds in there, it's estimated. And we'll go on to Saturn uh, on the Grand Tour. Of course, this is the showstopper when it comes to planets because of the rings. Uh, Cassini-Huygens was launched in 1997 and arrived in 2004 and uh, ended its mission in 2017. And they end these missions by putting the spacecraft into the planet uh, so that it doesn't, when they lose control of it, they don't want it impacting one of the moons or something. So they, they dump them into the planet. Very, very successful mission, mission uh, fantastic photographs, uh, named after Jean-Dominique Cassini, who discovered uh, four of the uh, uh, Saturn moons. And we have to see this. As it was doing its flyby of Jupiter, it took a number of images that uh, were put into this video here. Um, just fantastic. Uh, you can almost feels like you're there watching things rotate. That is Io and Europa, the two innermost moons. And now I've just got some full screen uh, images here. You can see the hexagonal feature on the North Pole there. Uh, lots of bands in the cloud tops, um, you know, ring system. The, the gap you see there is the uh, Cassini division, which is uh, named after Cassini. Uh, here's a close up showing the outermost, uh, well, not quite the outermost, but a thin outer F ring. And uh, you see the two moons there. Pandora and Prometheus, and as they orbit, they kind of keep the material in that, uh, in that outer ring. Uh, there's another moon below there, but it wasn't identified in the, in the caption for this image. And rings, we got rings. Um, the detail there is uh, quite amazing. 
these are basically you know pieces of uh, comets, asteroids, shattered moons, whatever that broke up uh, uh, in the gravitational field of Saturn. Uh, billions and billions of uh, pieces and chunks of ice and rock, and uh, yeah, quite spectacular. Zoom in, and it's just more and more and more detail there. Cassini also had uh, very, very uh, nice passes of Titan, the largest moon, and uh, discovered by Christian Huygens. Um, it has a very, very dense uh, atmosphere composed uh, largely of nitrogen, um, but we do get methane and ethane clouds, and it rains methane. Those dark features there are, are thought to be lakes of methane. Um, it's 100, minus 180 degrees Celsius there. Um, so very, very cold. The mission also had the Huygens lander, which landed on Titan and uh, lasted for a short while. Um, these um, chunks that you see there are actually ice and could be water ice. And at those temperatures, they're actually uh, harder than rocks. Uh, when you get water really cold, it, uh, it bonds quite tightly. Um, there is a future mission, which is uh, currently targeted to launch in June 2027, arriving in 2034, called Dragonfly. Uh, this is quite an exciting mission that will basically deliver a rotor craft. Um, the Titan's atmosphere is uh, four times denser than Earth, so it's, it's uh, quite easy to lift things off there. Um, and so it will become the first vehicle that will essentially do its whole mission by flying the entire uh, lander from uh, location to location on the, on the surface of Titan. Another uh, interesting uh, discovery by uh, Cassini was as it made passes over the moon Enceladus, it uh, discovered these plumes and uh, analysis shows that uh, there's a fair bit of water vapor in there. And uh, there was some evidence for hydrothermal activity deep inside the moon. And there's uh, some more than 200 of these geysers um, uh, blowing water out there. And the current thinking this is kind of the possible explanation. Again, much like Europa, a very, very thick icy crust, uh, but a layer of, uh, of liquid water. And with some fracturing, it's making its way and uh, escaping. And here's another image from Cassini uh, looking back at uh, Earth far, far away in the distance. Now let's do on to Uranus. Uh, this is uh, Voyager 2 now. And it's basically an icy giant. Um, it's mostly hydrogen and helium and a very small amount of methane, which absorbs uh, red light, which is why we get this kind of bluish green color. Uh, it, it's very bland. Um, it looks much like this at smaller scale in our telescopes. It's just a pale green disk. Um, the more interesting thing about Uranus is that it rotates on its side. Uh, at some point, it, it probably took a pretty good hit. So it's actually uh, rotating on its side um, where most of the planets are basically uh, upright or tilted off like the Earth is. Here is the image of the moon Miranda. Uh, who knows what happened there? Um, Probably it could have been collisions and reforming events to uh, end up with something that looks quite so bizarre. And it was onwards to Neptune. And Neptune, uh, the composition is uh, pretty similar, but it uh, has a distinctly bluer hue to it. Um, so there must be some other component in the atmosphere uh, that's not quite known yet. And here is the largest moon, Triton, uh, mostly um, an interesting one in that it orbits the wrong way. Uh, Neptune rotates one way and uh, Triton is retrograde, uh, which is uh, a little bit unusual. <laughs> and hopefully Dawn has uh, sorted things out and we will be going onward to Pluto and beyond or perhaps going back to Mars. So we're going to go backwards now, back from the outer planets, uh, right past, uh, we're going to go back to Earth and the Moon and hit Mars. And of course, Mars, if we've ever seen it in the night sky, uh, this is a waxing crescent moon, but Mars has this reddish tinge to it. And it has a lot of iron oxides, uh, think of it as rust. 
and it just has this reddish or orangey hue. So it's uh, a very neat planet being uh, the fourth planet out. And it's only the second largest planet. The only planet smaller than Mars is Mercury. Now, when you look at Mars through a telescope, no matter what size it is, it is small because it is such a small world and so far away. Um, what we see in this uh, diagram here, well, think of the early astronomers like Giovanni Schiaparelli, the Italian astronomer, Percival Lowell, the American astronomer. When they looked at this world with their telescopes, they could see that it had light and dark markings. And it seemed like some of those markings maybe had a linear component, even though they didn't realize it might be their eye playing a little trick on them. But, you know, it, it just just spurred on some you know science science fiction that maybe there is an ancient martian civilization and they're you know uh, piping or using canals to bring water from the melting polar caps to the warmer equatorial regions i mean it sounds great right so the only way you can prove that is by going there the first spacecraft to actually take pictures of another world was mariner 4 back in 1965 now, it, it just flew by. It didn't go into orbit. It didn't land or anything. It just flew by and took about 20 some odd pictures. And unfortunately, this did not help the stories of, you know, ancient civilizations and cities and canals. It looked more like the moon. I mean, very disappointing. But that, you know, the NASA engineers and scientists did not give up. They launched uh, in 1971 an orbiter called Mariner 9. Unfortunately, had some bad luck at land or went into orbit uh, at the time of a massive global dust storm and couldn't see a darn thing. But it did, uh, as things, uh, uh, there's a dust settled in around January of 1972 or 71, sorry. Uh, no, it would be 72. It, uh, it uh, actually took over 7,000 pictures and man, did it see some cool stuff. It showed us the largest volcano in the solar system, two and a half times the height of Mount Everest. I mean, this is not a dead planet. It, it, has some, it had some action way back when. And I, even more interesting was that it had channels. It looked like Mars was once a warmer and wetter world. And where there's water, could there be life? So they sent some landers back in, uh, launched in 75, landed in 76, Vikings 1 and 2. And you got to think of the time this was done. We didn't have cell phones or, you know, the internet wasn't around. They built these things way back in the 70s. Uh, you know, it, it's just, it's crazy what they did with this technology. And both landers work successfully. I remember I was going to university at this time, and this was during the summer. And the first picture that come back on July 20th, 1976, were these little strips of the photo. You could see rocks and some sand and dust, then a shadow, and then the footpad of the lander. I mean, we're looking at a, a footpad of a, of a machine sent by humans to another world. And eventually we got some colored pictures. Man, it was beautiful. This was this was stunning. Now, they had some three experiments to look for life on Mars, kind of like chemistry experiments. And I mean, I guess the, the, the conclusive or the, the conclusions are is that it wasn't, it wasn't conclusive. The results were not conclusive. And maybe there's a handful that think they did find some evidence of life but most think it's just a chemical reaction with the, sh with the soil. And um, if we go a couple, about a month and a half later, Viking 2 lands in Utopia Planitia, and what a great world to, to visit. But these are landers, they're fixed. You can only examine what's within your arm's reach. So way back in, uh, uh, launched in 96, land in 97, was a mission called Mars Pathfinder. And it was using a really novel landing technique. It came down on a parachute, and then an airbag inflated around the, the lander, and it literally bounced onto the surface. It deflated and uh, uh, unfolds its uh, solar powered pedals, and off, off comes this little, say, uh, uh, microwave sized uh, six wheeled rover called Sojourner. And this is a classic picture here where you'd see uh, uh, the rover with uh, Yogi Bear, the nose and the eyes and the forehead, and there's Yogi Bear. Now, Mars, uh, you know, the rover, that was such a success. Now, it only lasted a couple of months or two, three months. So NASA, let's, we got to do this again, but even bigger. So we've gone from, you know, microwave size to now, say, the size of a small golf cart. 
and you've got the Mars Exploration Rovers called Spirit and Opportunity. And I remember watching these landings on television in 2004 in January. And these things also, these rovers also used uh, the parachute uh, airbag technology. They both survived and they were guaranteed to work for just 90 days. And these rovers lasted for a very long time. Spirit lasted for uh, about six years and Opportunity was over 14 and a half years. Incredible for a 90 day mission. Opportunity even went into craters at, uh, you know, right down the rims of craters, looking at the geology and they could see signs of ancient dunes, ancient streams, groundwater passing through rock. I mean, what a, you know, this, this was, NASA's ma ma mantra was follow the water. Well, they were finding where the water was for sure. So opportunity lasted over 5,352 sols, eight Martian years and traveled over 42 kilometers, amazing. So we went from, we're now going from solar power there on the, on the left to something that uses plutonium. Let's go big now. Let's really give it some power for these rovers. And not only that, they're gonna be the size of a small SUV. Too big for airbags. So you use something you know, really off the wall called a sky crane, which is crazy. I never, never thought in a million years that it would work and it just worked perfectly. So the first uh, nuclear powered rover to land on Mars was Curiosity uh, back in 2012. It landed in a crater called Gale Crater. Right now it's on Sol 3240 and has traveled over 27 kilometers as it's starting to climb up a, a mountain called Mount Sharp. And it has found evidence of water certainly passing through uh, uh, like existing or flowing on Mars, literally. These are cross beds. And most geologists or all geologists know that this is formed by water moving across like a stream or uh, with flowing water. And this is just amazing. And this is a Canada's contribution on Curiosity is that we actually provided the alpha particle X-ray spectrometer. This is by the CSA, Canadian Space Agency, and it's touching the sands and the rocks of Mars. So that's very cool for Canada. Now, if in the news, been following the news lately this year, there are three new missions at the, the Red Planet. We have United Arab Emirates uh, Hope Orbiter. We have China's Tianwen-1. And it's an ambitious mission. And then, of course, USA NASA's Perseverance. The, the HOPE uh, mission or HOPE spacecraft is an orbiter sending back incredible views of the red planet. You can see some volcanoes or blotches on the surface of Mars. And China's mission is like they went all in. This is three missions in one. The goldy uh, part, uh, the gold insulated uh, spacecraft in the bottom is an orbiter with uh, an aeroshell lander and rover on top of it. So three missions in one. And on uh, uh, May 14th of this year, China's lander for the first time, you know, they ever tried this, landed softly on Mars. And then it deployed a rover called uh, Zurong. And not only that, they deployed a little selfie camera, like a think of putting a little GoPro on the surface of Mars and taking a picture. Oh, it just what a what a photographic opportunity! So they're uh, exploring uh, Mars. They have a ground penetrating radar to try to map how if, if there's water ice below the surface, how you know how far would you have to dig for it? That type of thing, because water is the key to the future of of sustainable development on Mars, because you use water, you can you know, use it for oxygen, water can be purified to drink, you can break it down to hydrogen and oxygen for rocket fuel. I mean, water, water ice is so important. Now, um, uh, going back to Perseverance this year, just to give you an idea how big it is, this is the sky crane. You can see the radar sensors, some of the rocket engines with their red covers, and this is the rover all tucked inside the aero shell. And in some of the earlier videos you might have seen on television uh, earlier this year, you see the heat shield fall away. Well, that heat shield's a four, it's four and a half meters across. This is a large lander. And here's that sky crane technology. I mean, it's basically coming down in a rocket pack lowered by tethers to the surface of Mars. Once they, they touch, they have a, a, the sensors touch down, they pyrotechnically cut all the cables and off goes the sky crane to cash a few, crash a few kilometers away. Let's watch the last minute of this landing this year. And uh, it is still, it's, I still get goosebumps watching it. So we're gonna watch this. Uh, so you're gonna see views looking down from the underneath the rover. And then on the left side, you'll be looking up at the sky crane and the sky crane looking down at the rover. We are currently performing the development 
So it's coming down in the sky frame. Just unbelievable. So here we are on Mars. Uh, first images come in. Of course, we have the um, uh, you know panoramas showing where they landed, and the landing site is truly brilliant for looking for signs of ancient life on Mars. I mean, they're they're at the mouth of an ancient delta. You can see here um, on uh, this uh, slide here, I don't know if my cursor is visible or not, but you can see the green line, the path they're proposing to take to travel in front of the delta, drive up onto the delta, drive along the delta, move along maybe some ancient uh, shallow water, marginal type in uh, depositional environments where there might've been say carbonates laid, perhaps algal mats. I mean, if you're really looking for life, this is the place to be. And then eventually following the, the old ancient riverbed all the way up to the rim of the crater and beyond. I mean, incredible, just brilliant landing site for looking for any signs of ancient life. And of course, the rover didn't travel alone. It brought a little helicopter, a little drone with it called Ingenuity. And this little helicopter is like those, well, it's not that little. Those blades are about 1.2 meters long and only weighs uh, about one and a half to 1.8 kilograms or four pounds. So it's very lightweight. And this is a, a, a history making moment right here when we see the very first powered flight on another world. Powered flight on another world. That's uh, April 19th, 2021. And those blades have to spin so fast as the uh, atmosphere density on Mars is about 1% or so of what we have here on Earth or less. So those blades have to spin at uh, RPMs of about 2,500. That's 2,500 revolutions per minute. Uh, most uh, aircraft or helicopters here on Earth travel at about 500 RPM. So this uh, helicopter has already made 13 flights. It was basically a tech demonstration. It has gone from tech demo to now operations. It, it's providing aerial support for the rover. So it's made 13 flights already. The next one should be tomorrow if all goes well. But the, because of the seasonal changes on Mars, just like on Earth, the atmospheric pressure is dropping. And they have to spin at even higher revolutions, about 2,800 RPM. They're not even sure if this little helicopter can hold together. It's just at the limits of its uh, operation. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm hoping it doesn't crash because it's providing great you know, images of the surface of Mars and helping the rover out pick out areas of interest. So here's a selfie of uh, the rover Perseverance. And one of its main missions is to collect samples to bring back to Earth. So just recently, uh, September of this year, uh, September 1st, in fact, just a few weeks ago, um, the, the uh, rover collected its first core sample. You can see the rock on the upper left with the uh, hole in it. And on the right is the uh, titanium tube with a, a chunk of Martian core inside it. Now it'll be capped up, stored inside the rover, and eventually dropped onto the surface for later collection. So here we see Perseverance uh, dropping the cores onto the surface of Mars, followed by another lander uh, landing on Mars near the same area, of course, uh, around Jezero Crater, where it would deploy a fetch rover. So this rover would then go out to where those uh, core tubes are um, dropped on the ground, collect them, bring them back to the lander, insert them in a rocket, which will be sent up into Mars orbit. Meanwhile, Earth has launched another spacecraft to Mars orbit to collect these samples 
and then eventually bring them back to earth. Very complicated. It will not, this will not all happen till about the year 2030, but it's something to look forward to because, uh, I mean, to have the samples back on earth, you can certainly do a lot more with the, uh, with those samples for dating and, uh, further analysis, looking for signs of ancient life. If you're looking for ancient, say, microbial or algal type life. Um, there's a mission launching next year in the period of August to October of 2022, with a landing in April to July of 2023. It's a European-Russian uh, combination. Russia's providing the, the, launch, uh, the launcher and the uh, lander. And of course, uh, Europe has provided the, the rover with a drill that can drill as deep as two meters below the surface to get better uh, uh, samples of what's unaltered below the surface there. So we'll leave Mars now and we'll go to the asteroid belt. Um, there have been many images of asteroids, mostly by spacecraft going to other targets, like going to Jupiter or Saturn or beyond. And they've just thrown in, let's just fly by an asteroid and see what's there or to a comet. So there are many pictures of asteroids. <coughs> And you can see they vary in size from uh, many uh, hundreds of kilometers to just a few tens of kilometers. And there's uh, comets on the very bottom for uh, some scale. But there are some missions I'd like to uh, focus on. Uh, this one just ended not that long ago, back uh, uh, in 2018 was end of mission. It was called Dawn. It was iron, uh, I use an ion engine. And it visited two asteroids, two of our largest asteroids. One's called Vesta, the other one is Ceres. And you can see them here uh, in comparison. Vesta turns out to be very much like a, a terrestrial planet to some degree. It has a dense core, has a mantle and a crust with these long ridges. On the right, uh, we have Ceres. And it seems like Ceres is a lot more uh, hydrous, uh, has a lot more uh, ices involved. So it may have formed in a different part of the solar system and somehow landed up in the asteroid belt. These images here show uh, very bright, salty uh, uh, deposits, perhaps from a salty brine that came up through cracks or fissures. And uh, this really has, you know, scientists scratching their heads, like how can this world, you know, may have had an ocean at one time when it was still warmer after its formation. Very fascinating worlds indeed. And of course, Orbiting is one thing. Well, let's bring some samples back to Earth. There have been at least three uh, uh, asteroid sample return missions, Hayabusa 1 and 2. Those are both Japanese missions and uh, OSIRIS-REx. So Hayabusa 2 just returned last December. And this is a, a time lapse sped up about 10 times to show it sampling its uh, target asteroid Ryugu. Here we see it descending. And it has a sample horn that fires a projectile like a bullet into the surface to fracture the rock, to agitate it, and it gets collected inside its uh, collection uh, chamber. And then it returns to Earth. This is an actual uh, fireball uh, image on the left there of Hayabusa 1 re-entering uh, over Australia. And on the right is a picture of Hayabusa 2 that returned on December 5th, 2020. And those samples are like, these are fresh, carbonaceous chondrite samples brought back to Earth. So can't wait for more papers to come out and be published as to what they found, because this is really fresh asteroid material. And of course, the Americans have their own mission called OSIRIS-REx. Uh, Canada is a major partner in this mission. We provided some LIDAR instrumentation. Um, it descended down to its asteroid called Bennu, and it uh, too had a, an, a different sampling uh, technique where it actually blew uh, um, high pressure nitrogen through its uh, sample collection device here. And it's agitated the surface of the asteroid and then it gets uh, placed into its chamber. And you can see on the right here uh, on this image, I don't know if my cursor is visible again, but these are like flaps that should be right flush with the interior of the uh, sample chamber. And you can see how it's bulging out. There's so much sample inside that it's preventing the flaps from closing firmly. So they're losing sample here. So they quickly decided to uh, place the chamber into its sample return canister and close up the lid and start its journey home. So just in May of this year, it started home. And uh, by, uh, I think in uh, this is September 24th, uh, 2023, so a few years from now, it will land in the state of Utah in some desert area, and the samples will be examined there. Again, another carbonaceous chondrite. These are very hydrous rich, very water rich asteroids that may have provided the water that we have on our planet today. 
So very important research there. There are a couple of missions uh, coming up uh, the, later this year. One's called Lucy, and it's uh, off to the orbit around the region around Jupiter, looking at Trojan. Uh, so these are clumps of asteroids in a stable uh, orbit between, like sort of off, uh, but leading and behind uh, Jupiter. And we're not really sure what's about, you know, we don't know about, a lot about these asteroids. So by going to fly by several of these, at least half a dozen in a 12 year mission, we'll learn a lot more about them. And then there's a, a nickel, a very uh, metal rich asteroid called, um, uh, well, it's a Psyche mission, going to visit this asteroid that's very nickel, uh, uh, iron nickel rich, heavy like just rich in that and uh it's launched uh going to be launched next year going into orbit of psyche in 2026 and of course you know if you can just visit and visit it and why not whack into it so there's a, a mission called double asteroid redirect uh, test where they're going to launch a satellite with an impactor and to hit a dual or a double uh, uh, asteroid so they're going to hit the smaller one and try to see if with ground-based uh, telescopes to see if that smaller asteroid's um, uh, motion has been slightly altered. And this is part of learning how to protect our planet. If we ever find an asteroid coming our way, can we redirect it by maybe just hitting it really hard? So we'll see. That's just uh, one experiment here. Planet call it planetary defense. Well, this is where I was supposed to turn it over to Jack to talk about the outer planets, but you've already done that. So let's go to the next uh, uh, part of the presentation here. And uh, let me uh, close this one. Go back to my presentations here. And let's go to screen mode. And here we go. I'm hoping, are you seeing my presentation slides again? Looks good. Okay, thank you. All right, so here we are uh, going past the outer gas giants like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and we're going out to the Kuiper Belt. And the Kuiper Belt is this donut-shaped area uh, in the outer edges of our solar system where icy bodies exist. And one of the largest ones is something we know all very fondly when we went to school. There were nine planets. It's the planet, or I guess dwarf planet now, Pluto. So back in, uh, uh, launched in 2006, uh, this uh, piano-sized uh, spacecraft with a big antenna on it, because it was going way out there to send signals back to Earth, flew by Pluto on July 14th and sent back incredible pictures of this dwarf planet. I mean, to be honest, I was blown away. I thought it'd just be this cratered, icy, dead world. And what we learned about um, Pluto just blew me away. It's, the surface is mostly composed of frozen nitrogen. Nitrogen. And we have these planes, these smooth planes with no craters on it, which means it has to be incredibly young. Maybe, well, I mean, geologically speaking, maybe less than 10 million years old. And it looks like it's flows of nitrogen, uh, ice flowing onto the surface here. It's just, you know, what is it? What's causing this? There's even uh, mountains of water ice harder than rock that we know here on Earth. And, you know, could source of some of this new material be ice volcanoes? We don't really know. I mean, this is just one flyby. And I mean, I wish there was another mission going out there right now. This is one of my favorite shots, shots an oblique view, looking back at Pluto. And uh, again, the, the, the sort of the eclipse shot, looking through the blue hazy atmosphere, of, um, you know, call it the smog of, uh, of Pluto, giving the bluish glow, incredible views. If we continue on, the spacecraft did have another target, uh, 2014 uh, MU69, and this is Erikoth. So uh, New Horizons that was able to find another Kuiper Belt object to fly by, much smaller, only about, I think, 35 by 20 by about 10 kilometers thick. So it's uh, very, you know, Look like you know two uh, two objects stuck together. So these were were probably two objects that that uh, in a low velocity collision just kind of stuck together. And this is what it looks like. It's just a bizarre, like a bowling pin. I don't know many different descriptions of this uh, uh, Arrokoth uh, object. And if we go beyond the Kuiper Belt, there is this sphere of icy 
bodies around us in the Oort cloud. And this is the region of the comets. And if comets get perturbed by, say, a collision or a passing star or something to, to perturb its orbit, these comets will come into the inner part of the solar system. And we might, I'm sure we all remember looking at Comet Neowise uh, back in uh, last summer. This is a picture taken from my backyard looking over Calgary, and you can see the comets uh, in the sky there. So these are icy bodies as they approach the sun, they warm up. Then these ices uh, don't melt, they sublimate, they go into a gaseous form and produce a coma around the nucleus or head of the comet and a long streaming tail. And there have been some missions to study comets, in fact, quite a few. Uh, back in 85, there was the International Comet Explorer. And then when Comet Halley was coming, many nations launched satellites. The European Space Agency launched Giotto, the Russians launched Vega, and they all flew by to see what this nucleus of a comet uh, looked like. So that's an icy uh, body in the center there with these jets of gas being released. And it's one thing to fly by a comet, but how about orbit it and send a lander? And this was uh, a European Space Agency mission called Rosetta and Philae, uh, launched in 04, uh, went into orbit around uh, um, this uh, comet called uh, churyumov gerasimenko or simply, uh, you know, CG, <laughs> and it, uh, it, it sent this little lander onto the surface. And I mean, my gosh, the images that were turned back of these giant cliffs, these jets of gas, uh, what, a, what an incredible mission. And uh, NASA has also sent missions out to collect pieces of the coma or uh, particles from the comet by flying through the, the um, comet uh, nucleus, or uh, actually, sorry, comet coma, uh, not the nucleus, the coma, so where the gases are, are, the particles are being released and collected these, um, if you can see my cursor, there's this little catcher thing up here using aerogel. So these particles are impacting on this aerogel, which are then folded inside the sample return canister and returned to earth in the sample return canister in 2006. And NASA also hit a comet. They love hitting things. So they whacked into comet uh, um, uh, uh, Violet, here, Violet here, and it, um, uh, or Temple One, sorry, and it uh, smashed into this comet, producing a crater, which was then able to be photographed later um, to see what, you know, what it revealed, and also what uh, spectra from the light of the blast, what it revealed in its composition. And it turned out to be a lot dustier. So one of the findings here, it wasn't as icy as they thought, it was a lot dustier than they originally thought. So this was in 2005. And now we'll end tonight's marathon presentation of uh, going back to the Voyagers 1 and 2 that uh, have actually left our influence of our solar system. They're now in interstellar space. I mean, they uh, left what's called the heliopause. This is the last influence that our sun has. And then you're basically exploring interstellar space. So Voyager 1 crossed into interstellar space on, in August of 2012, Voyager 2 a little bit later, no, uh, November 5th, 2018. And I think this is a great way to end tonight's presentation of robotic explorers exploring our solar system as we reflect on you know, humans' first emissaries uh, going out to the stars after exploring our solar system. And uh, I hope you've all stayed with us and uh, thank you for uh, you know, st uh, listening to our presentation, 2021, A Space Odyssey. Thank you, and now we'll take some questions. Great, thank you so much, Don and Jack. That was that was an amazing trip through our solar system. I, from from our armchairs, that's that's amazing. Um, we do have we do have a few questions that I'm excited to ask you. Um, first question is: How come there have been no spacecraft that have gone into orbit around the far outer planets? Well, they have to go very, very fast to get out there. So New Horizons, for instance, at its top end speed was going 17 kilometers per second. So if you think about that, one, two, three, it just went 50 kilometers. So in order to go into orbit, you have to carry a lot of fuel to take off that energy. Um, when uh, Juno went into orbit around Jupiter, the burn to enter the orbit was half an hour. So you would have to launch and carry an awful lot of fuel just to do the orbit. They will do it someday, but uh, it's, a, it's a difficult proposition. <laughs> Great. There are missions on the books to do that. Yeah. 
Uh, here's a great question. How are most of the Mars rovers powered? Um, I heard there was trouble with uh, dust affecting um, the solar the solar panel. And I, I remember that. I remember that opposition of Mars looking at it and I couldn't see any features through my telescope on it. It just looked like a just a ball of monochromatic color. Yeah, and that's a great question because the solar powered rovers, the reason MER, those Mars exploration rovers were only given a warranty of 90 days, they figured the dust settling down would start effectively cutting off power and they wouldn't be able to you know, last for years at a time. Uh, so what they didn't count on were dust devils, high winds that would fly over the space, uh, the land or the rover and clear off those panels, like someone taking a dust and blowing all the dust off. So they're able to get renewed life. They got higher solar energy uh, input onto their solar panels. Um, but the latest rovers, well, I shouldn't say, China is solar powered. The European Space Agency, uh, Rosalind Franklin, is solar powered or planning to be solar powered if it lands safely next year. Um, the, um, the, the two American ones, uh, Curiosity and Perseverance, use plutonium. So they're, uh, uh, they generate heat uh, through the decay of uh, radioactive material. Oh, that's yes, great. Canada actually had a, a concept for a little lander and they were actually going to shake the panels basically periodically to take the dust off. Oh, that's, that's really cool. Um, is there any concern about contaminating Mars with something from Earth on these, on these devices? It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> and, do, and how would you prevent it from happening? But I guess it's too they, late. But they do um, a, a pretty good job of sterilizing everything before they go. Um, but every now and then they realize that, you know, something was taken off again and not sterilized. And uh, so there are, you know, the early, early days, they didn't worry about it. They do a lot better job now, but it's not perfect. Cool. Um, here, here's a question. What do we hope to learn from the samples from the asteroids? And would space mining be better on asteroids or the moon? Well, wow, great question. Um, I mean, the moon would be a lot closer and easier to, uh, it depends what you're mining. Are you looking for uh, water ice to uh, fuel future spacecrafts? Or are you looking for metals? Um, or rare metals from uh, asteroids. I mean, there's been, there was talk of trying to redirect an asteroid into say lunar orbit or even an earth orbit to, uh, for study and mining. So I guess it depends what you're trying to mine might be the, 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 answer, the, the way to answer this question because the moon does have a lot of water ice which uh, will help uh, fuel future missions to study the moon or maybe beyond. I don't know, Jack, did you want to add anything to that? No, there, there are always missions that are looking at, um, uh, at, at the asteroids. Um, the, the expense right now uh, is, is uh, way, way too high. So you're not going after anything that's making it worthwhile at this point. Yeah, there are companies called Planetary Resources, which are proposing satellites to, the first thing you have to do is do an inventory of what are the asteroids made of, which ones are rich in certain metals, let's say titanium or something, gets, let's first map out which asteroids you want to mine, and then we'll tackle that uh, problem. As Jack said, just it's very expensive right now. Yeah, of course. Um, are there any future submarine missions planned to any of the moons? Uh, Europa, um, uh, they are looking at putting a uh, lander on there that would then have a device that would melt its way down uh, with a tether, a communications tether behind it. And they have done um, a, a little bit of experimentation on Antarctica. There are, there are some uh, uh, sub-ice lakes there, um, but you know they're looking at probably more than 10 kilometers of ice on Europa. So uh, how, how do you keep your tether flowing? <laughs> uh, but yes, they are looking at it. They, they look at everything, yeah. Oh, well, that's great. Um, the, the question is, um, is it conceivable that another outer solar system mission would be able to double up its destination and make a pass of some of the farthest outer dwarf planets, such as Makemake and Eris, similar to, to the New Horizons mission? Go for it, Don. Yeah, it's just 
it's a pro, uh, funding. I mean, right now there's nothing that's been funded. I absolutely, I'd love to see more images of those KBOs or those uh, distant icy objects. There right now is nothing that I'm aware of on the books. Uh, I know another Pluto mission, they're talking about going back uh, because it is such a fascinating system. I didn't even mention all the moons that go around it. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a little mini solar system in itself. But um, I, I'm not aware. I, it would be great. I'm sure there'd be many uh, uh, people interested in that, but the funding hasn't been uh, Yes, yeah, and, and the doubling up question is, 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 is pretty much not possible. Um, those faraway KBOs have um, very different uh, inclination orbits, elliptical. Uh, you'd have to get quite lucky to find an arrangement that will allow you to go from one to the other. Takes a lot of energy to change inclination. Yes. Yeah. Um, the aerogel collecting of the Stardust mission allowed a citizen science program to identify cometary particles. Are you aware of similar programs for present day robotic missions? Well, maybe not searching for aerogel, but they're certainly looking, uh, there was crater counting at one time. Um, geez, I'm not sure what, I thought there was a new one I just saw being announced and there's I can't, not, it just escaped. Yeah, there's not too many that are, are based on, uh, on, you know, sort of planetary objects. There's a lot of deep space ones, you know, yeah. classifying galaxies and stuff like that. Um, as a follow-up to the contamination question, um, with the contamination of Mars from these um, Earth robots, if there is organic material found there, how are we able to differentiate that from the contamination and actual um, biotic signals that were there presently? Well, thankfully, the climate is pretty harsh. Um, so it's unlikely that anything is uh, moving too far away from the landers. Um, and so they would most likely be trying to do any uh, you know, future sampling, they always go to a new location. So, um, yeah, the climate there is pretty harsh. It's uh, very, very low pressure, uh, wild temperature swings, etc. cetera, so. Um, here, here's a question about propulsion. Uh, in a nutshell, could you explain uh, ion engine technology? No, well, that's a Jack question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, uh, uh, ion propulsion is, is very interesting. They basically use, um, you know, the classic, uh, every action has a reaction. And what they do is they typically use xenon, xenon gas. And if you can imagine this, they, they have a sort of a, a linear tube where they accelerate uh, xenon atoms out of the back of the spacecraft. And you might think, well, you know, how big is an atom? <laughs> Uh, but they do it continuously for months on end, and they can actually generate uh, quite high velocities. Uh, Dawn was an ion engine spacecraft and was able to you know, move between two asteroids. So the whole secret of it is you're able to create very small amounts of acceleration, but over very, very long periods of time. Uh, the Starlink satellites are also using uh, ion engines uh, for their positioning. So it's a pretty well-known technique now. Well, that's and they use it on Star Trek. Yes, that's right. Yes, yeah. Uh, that that's great. I like the part where he said that Dawn was a was an ion engine mission. <laughs> I had to think about that for a second. It must be getting it must be getting late. But we do have a couple more questions, and then we'll we'll close the meeting. Um, are we still getting data from the Voyager crafts that have gone interstellar? Yes, we are. Till, uh, they're right now saying maybe till 2025 and beyond. But it's not much more than they're still alive. They, yeah. They've turned off the instruments because there's not really anything for them to, uh, to study now. Mm -hmm. um, is it true that proposals to send crafts to the moons of the ice giants are often scrubbed? Or even the gas giants? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's always proposals running around and there's, there's basically a competition and in the NASA world, you know, they have these big, large, you know, Cassini type style missions, so they can only fund one of those every so often. Then they do discovery type missions and, there, you know, there's, so there's always a competition. And so there might be 10 proposals of a certain uh, cost 
and uh, they compete and they can only choose a few of them. So it's not so much they get scrubbed as they get beaten out by a, a higher priority mission. And do they mean, were you, was the question maybe scrub for biological contamination? I wasn't quite sure. Just, just in general, it seems. Okay. Yeah, so there's always more ideas than actually ever take flight, yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. And um, I guess we'll close it off with uh, the Parker Solar Probe. Um, when it um, comes to its closest approach to the sun, um, what, what, how, how big would the sun appear in, in degrees? Or, or do I have to get out my geometry set tonight and work that question out? It would be large, let's put it that way. We're, we're, yeah, we're, we're talking, uh, you know, a small fraction of the distance that the earth is. Uh, the sun is uh, 109 times the diameter of the earth. So yeah, you could probably figure it out, but. <laughs> And it is just screaming going through there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it actually takes its solar panels and it tucks them back. There's just tiny little edges. You've got so much power. To, <laughs> you just basically uh, only need a very small amount of it as you're that close to the sun. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's wonderful. Um, reg regard, actually, there's one more. Regarding the internet satellite constellations with more and more companies sending, sending these up there, what are the chances of a potential satellite collision and are we just crossing our fingers or is there anything that, that is, that's being done? And it, it does happen. Uh, there have been a few collisions. Uh, um, one probably in the last five years, a, a, a dead satellite and a working satellite collided. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is they, they, they work pretty hard at um, creating the, what I call these shells and orbital planes so that it's uh, but not that likely, but what happens is, um, you know, these are mostly designed so they can deorbit them when they don't need them. So they don't just leave them flying around up there out of control. That's, that's when things start getting going. But if there are a hundred thousand up there, the, the odds are gonna go way up that there will be collisions, yeah. Yeah, like, uh, like the movie Gravity, would there be a Kessler effect uh, type event where you start expanding, yeah. you know, debris just expanding and taking out more and more satellites, who knows, but it's getting crowded up there, that's for sure. <laughs> no, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's true. And yeah, uh, as soon as there's more collisions, you know, it's just putting more and more debris there. Um, th Dr. Dr. Malone um, said that, uh, that the sun would probably appear as about 40 degrees across from, and that, <laughs> that is, that is That's absolutely big. insane for sure. <laughs> um, before before we close this off, I, I, I just I have a personal question, a quick one for each of you. If you had an unlimited budget for a planetary mission, what would you do? Unlimited budget planetary mission. I'd probably go to Enceladus. Yeah. You too, Don? Yeah, I think Europa. It's a little closer. And yeah. uh, they're just looking for signs of life. Beneath uh, in, in our in our solar system would be an absolute stunning achievement if we could prove that. Think of what it means. Perfect. And for our listeners, Enceladus is uh, is a moon of Saturn that that has been found to have a, an underground ocean. So certainly a, a a good location to look for for life. Now, but before we go tonight, if you take a look outside, it's clear. We have a nice. Uh, we waxing gibbous moon right above it that dot you see is saturn and the bright one to the left is jupiter so you can have a look at some of the things we talked about tonight well that's that that's great i think that's that's where i'm gonna head out <laughs> head out after after this presentation so you know uh, again i i really appreciate this presentation we've got lots of great comments um and yeah it, was, it certainly was a tour de force um thank you so much don and jack for being with us here tonight